evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, BOFAS Lectures of Distinction series. Uh, and tonight's lecture is on soft tissue reconstruction of the foot and ankle. Um, before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, the feedback code will be put by Joe in the chat section. So please have a look at that and make a note of this. Uh, also, any questions, if you can uh, send them through to the Q&A section, then we can filter those out. The format will be with the lecture and then questions followed by a case-based discussion as well. Now tonight, um, we have the privilege of having not only one, but two plastic surgeons from the world-renowned uh, St Andrews Centre for Plastic Surgery and Sperns Unit at the Broomfield Hospital. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Matt Griffiths and Adam Sirakowski uh, to give tonight's lecture. So over to Matt Griffiths. Evening all. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. I'll just share my screen. Is that uh, okay, Yasser? That's, yeah, we can see the screen. Great, good. Well, evening all. Thank you for your attendance to hopefully various co colleagues uh, <laughs> potentially around the world. Uh, so I'm Matt Griffiths, consultant plastic surgeon, and my eminent colleague, Adam Sirakowski, who works together with me at St. Andrews. Uh, thank you to Tim Williams from Colchester for the invite to uh, host this lecture. It's very kind. Uh, Joe Millard at Bofast has been very helpful in facilitating this, and uh, Yasagani, who's going to be moderating tonight. Um, so, I think really the first point I'd like to make is that uh, if you do have problems in the foot and ankle area and need plastic surgery, then you do have a problem. Your best thing you can do is try and avoid having us involved. But if you do have problems, don't panic, help us at hand or help us at foot. So uh, first of all, uh, any disclaimers? Well, my father was an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, my late father was an orthopod down in Portsmouth. Uh, he did lots of general uh, orthopedics, scoliosis, birthdays work. So I literally did grow up playing with, um, uh, with hip replacements. My son on the family note popped in when I was preparing this and asked, what is BOFAS? Uh, so I had to explain uh, what BOFAS was. He said, is it a cult? I said, well, that's interesting. To operate in the foot and ankle as an area as plastic surgeons, we, we try to avoid, to be honest, so perhaps it is. Uh, I said, no, it's the Foot and Ankle Society, and these guys operate on people with problems in that area from the skeletal point of view. Uh, they should have called it the Foot Club. The first rule of Foot Club, there is no Foot Club. Um, so for those of you, I hope, get the reference that this relates to uh, the famous film in 1999, known as the Fight Club with Brad Pitt. And uh, uh, I thought I had to annotate that uh, to the Foot Club. And obviously Tim Williams would have to take center stage from uh, Mr. Norton's position. Moving on, so foot and ankle fundamentals. For those, you know, we're aiming this really at the registrars in orthopedics who are going for their exam. The foot and ankle fundamentals you can get from the books, we'll touch on that briefly. Uh, I think really, Definitely in this area, prevention is, is, is better than cure. Your patient selection, I think, is key. Obviously, in trauma, that's difficult. But in elective work, I think selecting the right patient with the minimal comorbidities is a way to, evolve, to avoid a lot of heart, heartache. If you do have problems, there are maybe some conservative management things we can just talk about because we see a lot of foot wounds and lower leg wounds being managed in varying ways across varying specialties and paramedical specialities. Um, and then we can hopefully sort of give you an idea of a different areas of the foot and ankle, some of the local and other options that you have if you do get into trouble and need more complex reconstruction. Um, I think all are aware of the very specific um, biomechanics of the foot, the keystone structure of the arches, the support through the innate ligaments and the long tendons holding up the arch, and that these can all deteriorate with, with problems with morbidity and age. Um, in this area, from our point of view, the blood supply, I think, is also very important. It can be spasmodic, uh, 
it can be very much impaired in those with smoking, diabetes, etc. Uh, the tissues themselves are always described to patients that the lower leg is really like a Wellington boot. It's very, very tight. And to even take quite small skin lesions out can be quite uh, uh, problematic. It's very much dependent, you know, compared to those um, uh, lucky hand surgeons who can put everything in a sling. That's obviously much harder to do with the foot and elevation is, is uh, uh, more difficult. Uh, so the rehab can be more involved. Um, it's a very tight specialized structure of the glabrous skin, which is very adherent to the underlying skeleton. Um, scars can struggle on the foot because of the weight and the force is going through it. Uh, and from our point of view, we have to be very cognizant of the nerve supply and the blood supply to the uh, foot when we're doing reconstruction. So the givens that you may have, obviously, you know, you're doing elective work, then you may be given people with quite bad OA, uh, older patients, the rheumatoid patients can have horrible synovitis, their medications, aggressive medical treatment is very good for RA, but of course makes um, some of the wound healing more problematic with immunosuppression or, or um, modulators. The shark feet can be horrendous to look at sometimes, to be honest. And of course, trauma, you're given a situation, then you have to deal with it. Um, the diabetic foot is clearly an increasing problem in surprisingly young patients and can cause real heartache. And again, it's quite difficult to deal with. Um, with the diabetes, you can modify it. You know, I think that we see people for much bigger operations elsewhere in the, in the, in the, in the body. And if the diabetes is not well controlled in a, an elective situation, I think it is cognizant of us to really make that clear. They need to go away and get that sorted. For me, a really big red flag in all areas of the body is smoking. And I think that if you choose to operate on smokers for joint replacement uh, surgery in the ankle and the foot, it's not a question of, of if, it's when you will run into problems. Uh, obesity, of course, is a major factor, unfortunately. Um, steroids can sometimes be stopped. And in the background, just to reiterate, the vascular assessment is obviously quite key as well. And increasingly in the older population, the anticoagulants they're on, you may not be able to stop them if they've got stents and um, had a history of stroke. But if you're operating people who are going to bleed, hematoma, the chance of complications and infection are going to be elevated. And I think this is really is one of the key slides to take away. We have to keep our general medical head on to a degree before we move into specialty. One thing you really learn when you're doing private practice, because if you have problems, then you can't just leave it to the juniors. You have to deal with it yourself. Um, strict elevation, I think, is key for the resting limb. But of course, if they can mobilise appropriately after whatever surgery you've done, the foot pump will then help to put fluid up the leg and reduce the swelling. Uh, smoking cessation, I do an awful lot with uh, for patients who operate on in plastics. Um, Nicotine, vaping is better. You're not having the carbon monoxide, you're not having the, the tar in it, but it's not as good as really giving up completely. Uh, an option that can be used and patients don't often know about is Shampix, which acts centrally on the craving for nicotine, but isn't a nicotine replacement. It's contraindicated in those with, with depression. Um, when you're placing incisions, decisions, check for the soft tissues, if you do have a wound that you think will be more problematic, the leg is a bit more swollen, the skin isn't so good, or there's edema around, then the incisional vax can obviously be very useful. And we use those quite a lot elsewhere. Uh, I use them probably mostly in lower limb as well. Close wound management, so keeping an eye on wounds you think might be problematic. Other options that may be good, rather than steri strips, which cause blisters and can cause um, uh, quite a bit of discomfort, to be honest, and they also peel off. The bottom um, device there, uh, Prino tape, we use a lot for very long wounds. And it's very good, it's like a mesh. You can put along uh, the actual wound and you paint with Dermabond, the um, uh, flexible polymer, which helps to seal it. I have no, no disclaimer or interest in this device, but we do use a lot and it's very, very useful. Again, the key slide, <laughs> I put vascular assessment again, but I don't think that can be underemphasized. The number of times I've seen chronic ulcers, arterial or venous, um, wound healing problems in the lower limb, where coming from various specialties, where a straightforward duplex has not been entertained. And if you find a, a, a blockage proximally, then your friendly vascular surgeon can do a straightforward angioplasty, which works very well, has great long-term results, and is minimally invasive. 
So if you do have problems with the wounds, well, trombolent it. We are very happy as plastic surgeons for wounds on the vast majority to be showered and washed. Um, in the burns unit, we put huge wounds that we have into the shower on a bed, even tube and ventilated. They'll be washed down and then redressed. This idea of keeping wounds dry is silly. The, the, the skin is, is uh, flaky, bugs sit underneath it, and the act of showering will actually physically wash away some of the colonization. Air dry, then a fresh dressing on top. Um, I think if you're uh, going to be dealing with wounds, you should have a working knowledge of some useful primary dressings. So inodine is a good one. It's uh, antibacterial, it doesn't stick. Things like Gelinet, they dry out in 24 hours and they're a pain to get off the wound. So more modern dressings like inodine or some of the silicon dressings like Mepatil are a very good primary interface. And then over the top, you have your secondary interface dressing to absorb any exudate. If you do have a deep wound and you think there's a problem, then you'll suppress it with antibiotics. But actually, if you've got stuff that's infected, you're gonna to have to go in, take it out, debride it properly, pick deep bony specimens after the debridement, see what you're growing, temporize with um, negative uh, pressure wound therapy, and then consider your options for delayed primary closure or whether you have to ask us to, to be involved. Conservative treatment sometimes has a place, you know, a fractured fibula, if it's stable elsewhere, with an infected plate, you can take the plate out, vac it through, I've done that, overdraw the bone holes and then vac it, and it will heal on its own. I've got away with that uh, two or three times. It's not often that we graft, really. Um, I think if we have problems, we're going to want to put a flap of tissue over something, particularly if it's coming from orthopedics because there's metal that probably is involved. Um, so of course, as it's a flap rather than a graft, the flap has its own blood supply and there are some local options or you can use regional options, or sometimes we have to do the more complicated free flap. So we'll go through this in more detail. We'll just quickly run through um, uh, some of these. So a V to Y advancement, that's a local flap within the foot, can be used more for, for skin cancer excision or small ulcers. If someone's got a bigger defect on the heel, and I'll show you a better example later, then a, a medial plantar flap is using the non-weight bearing area of the foot as a donor site. Um, free flap options, there's a few that we have, and I'll talk about muscle versus fascia cutaneous uh, later, which Yasser thought might be useful. But um, because the defects aren't very big, typically, then the gracilis is often a good option. It's a very quick harvest, it's very reliable, um, gives you a nice long thin bit of muscle to cover linear defects, has a very reliable pedicle, it is a bit shorter, um, but it will need a skin graft over the top. The donor site is fantastic. Um, you may have come across an ALT flap. Now the anterolateral thigh flap is a real workhorse for head and neck cancer, for chest wall resurfacing, sometimes abdominal wall reconstruction, but also in the lower limb. One thing here is a very good example of how variations in geography can cause great heartache. So if you go to Taiwan and you'll see these beautiful ALT flaps, they're raised which can be six millimeters. Um, in the Western population, shall we say, they can be a little bit thicker. And I have ALT flaps that are two inches thick. And it looks like you're putting a Cornish pasty in someone's leg and you have to put a skin graft down the side. So you have to be a little bit aware sometimes what works in one country is not so translatable elsewhere. Um, but with the ALT flap, it is a good long pedicle and the skin quality is excellent. For a smaller defect, you may want to use a groin flap so the groin flap is a nice small piece of skin, but the vessels are very short and they're quite small. So technically it is much more difficult to use. But if you're doing a, a, a reconstruction around the ankle, it, it does have a real place, and especially in a young lady. Then the workhorse that we have, which you may have seen for big defects is the latissimus dorsi. It's a quick harvest, very reliable pedicle, nice big vessels that will match the lower limb vessels nicely, end to end. It'll resurface the whole lower leg for you. It does need a big skin graft over the top. And the function um, is actually not greatly affected. You can still use crutches afterwards. So from the point of view of types of flap, essentially it's got a big hole, it's got to be a muscle flap in my, in my hands anyway. If you have a smaller defect in a more skinny area, perhaps around the ankle, then you may be planning to use a fascia cutaneous flap. And you could argue perhaps in the sole. But um, for the muscle flap, it's easy to raise, like I said. 
Um, if you have a, a, con a defect where there's been bone taken away and you've had osteomyelitis and you sorcerized it, or you've got a segment that you need to fill in, the muscle will, will swell and it'll just obliterate all the little nooks and crannies. So your chance of having a sort of low grade infection later are less. And of course, any long term antimicrobials <coughs> through a pit line for six weeks will be delivered through that vascular muscle right onto the area that you need it. So it's probably got a better role in osteomyelitis, though the data can be hard to prove. Downside, you tend to put a skin graft over the top because if you take a muscle flap with a skin panel, it can be very thick, though we do show that later. And because it's muscle, it has a lower tolerance to ischemia. So if it fails, if a person has um, arterial issues, if they have a DVT, which I've had, then if it goes off, it's actually, you won't salvage it, it'll be in the bin. Ischemic time is probably about four hours. For the fascicotanus flap, then uh, if you have the right habitus on the patient or a groin flap, it will be thinner. So they're better at resurfacing flat areas. Skin quality is better. You can actually neurotize the nerves sometimes. Uh, and because there's no muscle on the whole with a fascicotanus flap, though you can do them together, uh, you put it more chance to salvage it if it goes blue and it turns a funny color after the operation. Um, it is more technical. So the perforated flaps, when you're following a small vessel between the muscles for the, these kind of things, um, it is a bit more technical to raise uh, under a microscope. So one thing that I thought might be useful for those to an exam was to have a look at um, what kind of um, uh, papers are out there. And on the whole, it is not very many. Few heterogeneous, uh, quite uncommon, uh, often small series with various different types of reconstruction. Um, a group here in 2010 looked at 30 cases over three years trying to compare muscle and perforated flaps, which might be useful. Um, then there's a bigger series here with 226 cases by Yulang with, I mean, a bewildering range of flaps, like 14 different flaps used to um, uh, cover various area, areas of the body. So it's hard to put out significant statistics on that. Um, you should probably wear the LEAP study back in America, which is Low Extremity Assessment Protocol back in 2006, um, uh, which is varying data coming out of that. And then more recently, was it 21, 21 all rent study, which got my eye because I was a breast surgeon, uh, but not around implants. This is to do with a group of trainees, but I believe, who've done a study looking at compliance of the base 12 guidelines. Um, so this is interesting and maybe contemporaneous for exam because they looked at a fair number of patients and essentially if people followed the guidelines, of which only about 40, 41% of units did, uh, then it was associated with a higher rate of discharge within the first 12 weeks. So that's a contemporary paper that might be useful to discuss in the exam. Right, so what options do we have? Uh, some pictures of some things. I mean, clearly, you know, you've got distal toes that have been crushed beyond belief. You won't be calling us, you just chop them off. Um, consider in so superficial injuries and burns, we won't cover burns in this talk because if you have a burn to the hand, genitals, feet, face, that needs to go from your uh, unit A and E, whatever, to a specialist burn center. And uh, it's not really something that you should be managing in this country anyway, in a normal hospital. Um, with the reconstruction, yeah, we're trying to preserve those weight bearing areas, obviously for longevity. Uh, we're trying to provide a sensate reconstruction if we can and as much as possible firm robust skin. If you have a big wobbly reconstruction, then it's hard to walk on it. Uh, glabrous skin, uh, if you go back to your basic science, I'm sure you remembered that has a thicker cornified layer compared to the normal uh, skin. It has an extra layer, the elucid layer. Um, and the stem cells, if you look at the stem cell distribution, in hairy skin, they're clearly focused around the hair follicles. Whereas in the uh, glabrous skin, the stem cells are laid out equally. And that's one of the reasons why uh, it does heal so well for sort of superficial injuries. And obviously in most people it's hairless. Um, so one of my retired colleagues, Mr. Ranjan, was a bit of a pioneer of the concept of V to Y flaps. So here you have a defect, you raise a flap in a V shape adjacent to it, and then you slide that forward and you close it as a Y. And with this uh, lovely drawing, he's a very good artist, you have various options for advancing flaps, essentially from the instep, that's the donor site and you're really advancing from. And you can curve flaps around, um, sometimes closing the tip like a fish mouth. 
uh, to fill in these defects. The heel, you'll have to use a medial planter, which we'll show in a bit. But in someone who has a more of a cutaneous skin cancer kind of lesion uh, or a superficial um, full, thin, a full thickness burn, you could do this for, um, or potentially even a small uh, ulcer. You'll take it out, excise it, and then advance that flap as a V. It does look a little tight. There'll be some elevation going on. And uh, note that he, had a, he did have a toe deformity before the operation was started. Uh, here's a picture actually from Adam. So in children, clearly it's a bit different. Uh, I assume a lawnmower injury, uh, they've lost a couple of toes. So trying to restore the width of the forefoot and cover the metatarsals. Here, a good option in the kid is a groin flap because their vessels in the foot are really pretty small and the vessel in the groin will match that end to end pretty well. Um, for those of, the, of you doing uh, MTP joint reconstruction, then obviously this can be a bit of a heartache if you do have a problem. Um, you know, we know you guys are very good at avoiding deep infection. We don't really see that many hips, knees or, or feet um, prosthesis infections, to be honest. But if it does happen and, you know, maybe you have to remove the joint, uh, temporize for the space you're in, then there are options to resurface that, which will give you a pretty good foot contour. You know, this person's going to get back to wearing normal footwear, I'd hope. Um, and a small flat plumbed into the anterior uh, tibial, or to say this pedis vessels, um, and then the veins and the dorsal and the foot can restore that area. Uh, so going back to that one, just to mention, this is an extra flat that's come in more the last few years called an end sap. So it's from the medial part of the calf, Adam will show this again later, uh, off the medial serial artery called a uh, sap flap or end sap flap. Uh, and it's quite nice because it's in the area and for a small defect, the dome site works for it really well. And the vessels you get with it are surprisingly good. Heel reconstruction, bit of a classic. Uh, really in this area, trying to heal this conservatively won't work with exposed bone. You're gonna to have to, you can't graft it because you've got bone underneath. There's probably some gentamicin beads under there. Uh, so what you're gonna to have to do is to swing around a flap of skin. And the medial planter is the absolute classic way to reconstruct this area if you have someone with a heel osteomyelitis. <laughs> um, so here we have vessels going to the middle part of the flap and we have nerves coming off there. And under the scope, what I'm trying to show is the, the nerve to the medial part of the, the flat we're going to keep, whereas the foot to the toe, we're going to split out and uh, um, preserve sensation to the toe is distal to the, the reconstruction. Here you can see that the um, uh, textbook for once actually, hopefully is fairly close to what we're seeing in, in, uh, uh, in the foot, which I was quite chuffed with. And then you swing that bit of uh, glabrous skin round with sensation, and that's going to give you the most robust. But the donor site can be the most problematic. Uh, he can see you have to put a skin graft or um, double template to try and restore that. And they can take a bit of time to heal, but it's away from the weight bearing area. So um, hopefully long term, not too much of a problem. Again, another lady here with the decubitus ulcer. You've got bone exposed. Now you could argue you could graft this. But if you put a skin graft on this, the actual skin quality is really not very good. Um, so it won't last very long. So you've got quite a thin, pliable foot, which is nice. Taking the, the, sap, the medial plantar flap, rotate that round over the heel, and then a split skin graft over the donor side. Is it a borrowing from Peter to pay Paul? Neuropathic heels. Uh, this one is one that we're dealing with currently. He had the initial injury actually a decade ago, white van versus lower leg giving a compound tip fib, heel uh, problem, and actually fractured the foot and a degloving of the foot. So a real complex injury. Um, not one really want to amputate because he's a sensate foot and he's in his twenties. Uh, and also you can see that the stump will be quite problematic in itself. So for this kind of wound, we are going to do a full debridement. Uh, you can see that the unicortical fracture of the calcaneum, degloving of the heel, open tip fib, and this is something where you're going to your friend, the lat dorsi. So yeah, if this comes in the exam, you're going to stabilize it, call plastics if the foot's viable and sensate, and then uh, put LD over the top. Nice tattoo, borrow some muscle, put it over here, and then resurface it with a, a split skin graft. Um, tattoo slightly out of alignment, but he was pretty happy with that. There's a picture of the x-rays, because I know you guys will want that. Bit of a bone gap still, but it's straight flap healed nicely, and then he was converted to a TSF, uh, I think the Royal London, um, and actually united his bone gap spontaneously. So 
And we'll say that the uh, Tismus Dorsi helped that because it provides such nice revascularization. Um, view from the side, the heel took longer to heal because it was a bit numb. And we're going from that to that, and then later it discovers his frame, actually walking without a crutch for a good decade. However, it's come back this year because of the neuropathy in that area. Um, you can see that uh, he's ended up with this little sinus. So we're going to go with that area, debride it, advance it, try and close it, and then going to um, uh, see that works. If not, he may need a free flap. So in the meantime, I'm not feeling the vascularity, and he's going to have a he's had his CT angio. They think there's some calcification in the uh, area, but that's actually in the LD. To me, his posterior tibia looks pretty good to the foot, but they're wide out at an issue proximally, so he may need an endarterectomy. But I'll be honest, look at the scan, I can't see what they're talking about. So we're going to discuss the scan in more detail. Uh, neuropathic foot, this guy has a very, very rare congenital neuropathic issue. Um, he uh, had this uh, ulcer form, mistreated by a colleague, looks like it is a stress fracture of the calcaneum, I think was the original problem. And they took that out and then unfortunately his medial plantar flap just didn't work. It wouldn't stick. He had pseudomonas infection, distal breakdown, some gentamicin beads trying to fight that. Um, and then uh, that colleague uh, moved away. So I took over <coughs> the case and we've gone to Bacillus. So here, because you've got the deep underlying sort of, you know, slightly cortical issues in the calcaneum, I said, we have to, you know, really go for the, the big option here. And his vessels are very good. When you put a muscle flap in, there's a bit of picture here. You can see it does really swell. We know that, and it always settles down as the skin graft heals and contracts in. That contractor is actually very useful in this situation. Over the top, tube grip, but that muscle underneath is really sitting on the bone and helping to get rid of any nasty bugs. Um, and he fell over day eight and evolved part of the anterior part of the flap. When we thought we were out in the woods, I had a heart attack, he was absolutely mortified, but thankfully we managed to heal that and resuture it. And then later on, a bit dry because there's no skin glands, there's sweat glands in the in the graft, but his old middle plant adenocyte is behaving, the flap's settling down and he can walk on his heel. And the bone, just to show you, the bony pictures are all fine. There's some clips in my gracilis. So unusual problem after that, not something we see very often really, is the calcaneal uh, infection. I presume mostly because, um, you know, fairly uh, treated, treated conservatively, but this chap had jumped off, uh, I think he was stoned off a balcony, fractured calcaneum, uh, which was fixed in North America. Um, he had wound healing problems. So he then decided to uh, go to um, England to help his uh, girlfriend unload the grandmother's house as she died, unfortunately. So um, he came over with a discharge infected heel, which is really not very much ideal, and um, came to us with, I suppose, plate and really kind of frank osteomyelitis. So, of course, first thing, basic principles, open up to bride to set the metal work out. But I think because of the complexity of the infection, um, the orthopedics were really not keen and felt the whole thing was going to fall apart and he's going to lose his arch. So we elected to do deep samples, washed out, vacked, and then did um, in this area, you've got to get something in the hole. So Gacillus would be an option, but I, I was feeling because he was a manual worker that we wanted the ideal skin and also to try and put some dermis and the tip of the flap in, in the hole. So we did a forked ALT flap. So that's the side of his thigh taken off, the end of it split, one, one end demethialized and then put it down in that hole in the middle of the ring. And I think we left gem beads in there as well. And then the second flap put out, the second fork put over the top of that and then swung round to the anterior tibials because you're a long way from the local vasculature. You can't go into the perineals. Um, and it healed very nicely. Then he went back to Canada, so I can't do the long term results of that one. So that's covered hopefully some principles and how you can approach things. Preventing problems in the foot and ankle is best. I reiterate patient selection is really key. Um, that the, there are options to deal with problems in the sole and around the heel, classic options, and around the, the um, calcaneum as well. And now my colleague Adam Serkowski will take over the sharing.
and uh, go through some um, ways of managing the uh, area around the ankle. Thank you. Adam, I've come out. Uh, are you able to uh, start sharing? Yes, I am. Thanks, Matt. Um, are you able to see that okay? If you're going to... Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on today. Um, I'm going to take over from Matt and start uh, talking a little bit about uh, ankle coverage uh, more specifically. So, you see quite a broad range of ankle defects, um, ranging from the sort of low velocity trauma um, in older, usually in older people who sort of go over their ankles uh, outside, um, ranging up to sort of big degloving injuries, which we'll go on to later. I think this sort of low, low velocity defect is, is probably the most common um, wound that we're called to go and see um, by our orthopedic friends. In this case, um, it's sort of distal uh, tibial fractures being fixed with um, Steinman pins driven up from the foot, which uh, Matt tells me was the hardest wounds to heal. Um, these sort of defects, you're looking, if possible, to, to manage with local flaps uh, based from the um, posterior tibial artery perforators. So it's really important um, to sort of expose those wounds extend extend your wounds carefully and if you're going to do fasciotomies really stick to the back press boa guidelines um, because you don't want to roger those perforators which we find ever so useful to to base our flaps on and the ones really that we use most often are the uh, perforators coming off the posterior tibial artery at 5, 10, and 15 centimeters from the tip of the medial malleolus. It's the 10 centimeter one that tends to be the most uh, robust and useful. Um, this is the classic picture. I think that every plastic uh, registrar going for their exam knows from the Batpress BOA guidelines handbook. Um, green markings show the borders of the tibia, uh, and then the blue lines, your incision lines. So it's one to two centimeters. Um, medial to the posterior border and two centimeters um, anterior uh, to the anterior border and you want it's that posterior incision um, that you need to try and keep anterior to the posterior tibial artery so you don't cut across your perforating vessels um, again a lovely picture here from our previous colleague mr naranjan who um, was a renowned plastic surgeon at our unit at St Andrews and a great illustrator. And uh, you can see, first of all, we'd make an exploratory incision, uh, find those perforators coming into our flap tissue, divide the most proximal perforators so that we can actually pedicle our flap round and get it to swing round, and then flip that skin over into the defect. Of course, moving that skin round is gonna leave you a donor site defect. And that's normally, uh, treated with a skin graft. One of the reasons in the foot and ankle that it's quite difficult actually to use local flaps, especially as you go more distally, is that lifting that skin and swinging it across um, does leave um, potentially other tendons and nerves and vessels exposed. So you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, but you don't want to take too much away from Peter, otherwise you sort of know better off. So here's an example of uh, a large fasciocutaneous flap uh, for that previous defect, actually. And that's this is called a V to Y flap. And you can see why it's a, a large uh, back cuts are made, um, taking the fascia with you, taking those perforators and then sliding that skin down. And, and that leaves you a little tail that's closed as a, a Y. It's... Um, it's remarkable sometimes how far back we have to make our cuts just to get a sort of one and a half centimeter um, medial ankle wound closed. Um, but fortunately from experience, you know um, how far you need to make these back cuts to get your flap to move. 
it doesn't always have to be a full uh, V to Y. Sometimes we get nice movement with what's called a hatchet flap. So that's made, basically making one uh, back cut uh, from the wound and then sort of pivoting the skin forward. Um, but these sorts of flaps, I think, are most commonly used for these low, low uh, energy trauma, typically your older patients who maybe, you know, won't tolerate free flaps or don't need them. Um, I was fortunate enough as a sort of senior trainee to spend a lot of time in uh, India at uh, Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, which is probably the ultimate um, orthoplastics collaboration because it's run by two brothers, uh, one a senior orthopedic surgeon and the other a senior plastic surgeon. And, um, you know, they have the whole hospital at their disposal. And there's a great volume of trauma um, uh, that comes their way. And, you know, being there was an opportunity to see an awful lot of different types of reconstruction that you might not have potentially picked up in the UK. Um, this is quite an interesting little flap called a, a pedicled uh, peroneus brevis muscle flap. Um, and it involves basically peeling off the peroneus brevis muscle from the fibula, um, keeping the muscle alive um, on a perforator uh, coming off the uh, peroneal artery. Um, it's normally about six or seven centimeters proximal from your um, lateral malleolus. And then you've, you've got this nice strap of muscle that you can sort of swing down and use to cover defects of the lateral malleolus or the anterior ankle it won't quite get as far around as the medial malleolus and it's only a few centimeters wide, but this is really useful sometimes, especially um, perhaps in older patient who's got more comorbidities. You can get this operation done in about 90 minutes um, and get, you know, otherwise potentially quite troublesome defects covered. Because it's a muscle flap, it's going to need a, a skin graft on top of it afterwards. But it's a nice uh, donor site to close. It's basically a nice straight scar down the lateral side of the leg um, and a really useful op option sometimes. Slightly larger defects then, um, you know, your, your local options are potentially getting a little bit more limited. Um, younger patients, you might be looking for a sort of better cosmetic outcome. And as Matt was saying, the free groin flap often provides an ideal solution. Um, you can see that it can give you some really nice, quite thin, pliable skin. Um, here's uh, one of our colleagues, Mr. Emma Christian, marking up a groin flap. Um, as I say, the benefits of this flap, very thin, pliable skin. Um, it gives you an excellent donor site in the groin. It can, however, be quite a short pedicle and the anatomy can, can vary sometimes. So it's sometimes a little bit of a tricky one to, to raise and it does give you a short pedicle. Um, it's based on the superficial uh, circumflex iliac artery um, and you raise it by basically peeling it from lateral to medial, going deeper as you cross the um, lateral border of the sartorius and then you come subfascial. Um, this is a picture from microsurgeon.org, which again is another sort of go-to for plastic surgery trainees. And, uh, you know, it's a great aid memoir for, for your flap anatomy. And this is where plastic surgeons spend most of their time down a microscope looking at little vessels like this, uh, taking hours trying to raise uh, little flaps. Um, but ultimately you get this lovely um, piece of tissue uh, useful for covering these defects. And that, as I say, that's the groin flap donor site. It's, it's a great donor site. It's hidden by underwear and, uh, you know, you're not going to see that. And this is the flap in set afterwards with a little drain to, um, to help prevent any hematoma. And you're away. Another option is the free gracilis muscle flap. Like uh, Matt said, this is a really uh, great workhorse flap. It's um, much easier harvest. You can normally get one out in under an hour. And it's a really good space filler because the muscle uh, contours and fills holes and brings in blood supply and can help with bone healing. <coughs> As I say, 
it can have quite a short pedicle. Uh, the muscle does swell afterwards. So you've got to be careful with your dressing as you don't want to constrict it because you can kill it if you're not careful. Um, it can be difficult to de debulk if or go back into afterwards, unlike a fascia cutaneal flap, which you can lift again quite, nice, quite nicely. And some might argue as well that the skin graft on top of the muscle is a little bit less durable than the nice skin that comes with the fascia cutaneous flap. Um, here's a residuous flap being harvested. Um, and again, more time spent under the microscope and a really uh, nice dome site on that. That's the skin graft stapled on uh, onto the gracilis flap. They normally take really well, um, and they tend to heal a little bit darker than the, the, you know, than the normal skin. There is this question about durability. Sometimes people worry about these flaps on weight-bearing areas or areas prone to friction, uh, such as the back of the ankle or um, dorsum of the foot where you might wear shoes. Um, but to be honest, I've never really had a problem with uh, ulceration or breakdown on these flaps. And Matt showed a really nice picture of a gracilis flap on the heel of the foot. And that goes to show how robust they can actually be. And although they do swell initially, <coughs> excuse me, they do settle down and atrophy quite nicely and um, can contour really well. So larger defects. Things can get a little bit crazy now. Um, you can get some horrific degloving injuries sometimes. Um, and, you know, here we've got a case where the calcaneus has been exposed. Um, and so has most of the sole of the foot and dorsum. And here, a free latissimus dorsi flap can be really useful. Um, it's an extremely versatile flap. You can see it gives you. Uh, a skin paddle potentially, um, as well as a really nice large sheet of muscle that you can wrap around defects. Tends to have a long pedicle, um, so you can get it to exactly where you want it. Uh, as I said, nice broad sheets of muscle uh, that can be wrapped around defects. It's a bit of a pain sometimes though that you have to um, change the positioning of your patient halfway through so that adds to the operative time and you've got to sort of uh, bear that in mind when you're planning your surgery. Um, there can be issues sometimes with the donor site, you know, it potentially leaves you with quite a large scar on your back. Sometimes people can develop seroma formation which needs draining. Um, from a functional point of view, people don't tend to miss it. You always say that it's not one for rock climbers if you need to do that particular action, but for most people day-to-day -day life, um, they get on pretty well without it. But it's a great large um, workhorse flap and probably the biggest one in our armamentarium. Um, here you can see that it's uh, that, that um, Skin pedal pedicle is a really good option for, for putting on the weight bearing area. So you can put that on the sole of the foot. It also helps you monitor the flap. So we'll come and check that area every hour to make sure that it's got a good capillary refill and the flap's well perfused. And then the muscle part of the flap, you can swing around and basically do what you need to do with, and you can wrap the entire foot with it potentially. Other options for these big defects around the ankle, um, you're looking at a large free anterior lateral thigh flap. ALT is a nice flap because it gives you a really great um, skin um, paddle uh, that you can use to give a nice um, aesthetic result, good quality, robust skin coverage. So it doesn't need a skin graft unlike a lap dorsi. You can take it with muscle, um, or you can take it just as fascia cutaneous. Um, you can fork it and do things with it like Matt's shown. It's got a fairly long pedicle uh, and the pedicle dissection itself is fairly constant. Sometimes you can get a little bit caught out with the perforators. They can be quite a tricky intramuscular dissection sometimes, um, but generally it's a, it's a great versatile flap, useful for um, filling space defects and providing good robust skin cover and you can see here um, how you can take the the anterior lateral, lateral thigh flap with a huge chunk of uh, vastus muscle if you need to uh, 
Um, so in this case, that muscle was wrapped around the um, sort of posterior border of the ankle into that big hole around the heel. And then the skin paddle used to reconstruct the rest of the defect. And uh, again, like Matt says, sometimes it can be a bit of a uh, Cornish pasty on the side of your leg. Um, but what I tend to do is um, let them take, let them heal, give it six months, and then you can always come back with a liposuction cannula and suck the, the fat out of the flap, thin it nicely, and redrape it. And at the end, you can get a very nice aesthetic result for the patient. If all else fails, this is a, you know, one from the textbooks, really. You very, very rarely see this used um, these days, but it's, uh, it's a sort of great, great get out of jail flap, if you like. So, for example, if you've got no good um, donor vessels, a very sick patient, potentially, um, there's no local options, you've sort of burnt all your bridges, then you can take some skin from the uh, contralateral leg and flip it over and attach it into the defect. Uh, bandage the patient's legs up together for three or four weeks, allow the flap to pick up a blood supply from the periphery from the other leg and then uh, detach it. So that's a classic old school um, pedicled flap that um, plastic surgeons grew up with really. <coughs> and then there's these defects, the sort of Achilles tendon defects. And they're, they're you know, they're, they can be quite challenging sometimes. And I can imagine from, from an orthopedic surgeon's point of view, they can be, um, you know, your typical heartache patient and a, and a difficult problem to deal with. There's just um, no skin really going spare there. So this area won't tolerate um, closure under tension. Quite often you've got uh, Achilles tendon reconstructions that have taken place. Um, there may be ether bond or fiber wire suture material in there that can form a nidus for infection and can start working its way out or just causing a chronic um, sinus that just doesn't want to settle down. We get faced with a sort of broad range of uh, referrals, ranging all the way from a sort of sloughed out Achilles tendon on the left side there, um, you know, to, as I say, a sinus that just may, may not heal. And typically what's going on in there is there's some suture material that's um, starting to work its way out. So there's various options we can use to repair these Achilles um, area defects. Uh, this, before we get onto that, that's uh, Matt actually removing a fiber wire suture. He's quite cunningly used um, the Sonocyte uh, Doppler that we use for putting our interoperative blocks in to find the suture material. Uh, and then gleefully pulling that out with uh, an artery clip there. And then, of course, thorough debridement's the, the key. Um, the suture material has been removed. It looks like the Achilles tendon is actually intact. All the sort of chronic granulation tissue is being removed. Um, and we'll make sure it's uh, nice and clean and ready to put a flap on top. <coughs> Another key principle is always thorough debridement. It needs to be pristine. You, you don't want to be putting free tissue onto an area that's still harboring any infection or necrotic unhealthy tissue because it's bound to cause problems later. Um, you'll get a flap that starts lifting. Um, you may get a late infection. Things start sloughing out and generally the reason it's not being properly debrided. So the gracilis flap is actually really good for filling defects of the Achilles tendon and this is one that I did in a chap who actually enjoyed playing basketball. And he had about a two centimeter defect in the Achilles tendon, which we didn't try to reconstruct with any, um, say fasciolata or tendon grafts. We just put in a, a nice uh, blob of gracilis muscle into that wound. And what you find is that the gracilis scars up and forms this fibrous sheet and it basically restores the continuity of the Achilles tendon. And this guy's actually standing on his tiptoes here. And um, you can see that he's able to get his heel off the ground 
Um, the gracilis muscle itself has uh, contoured really nicely. It's atrophied down um, and it's provided him a nice reconstruction. Some might argue again um, that the gracilis can be a bit less durable, that you'd worry about footwear rubbing on this area. Um, they don't always atrophy down this nicely. They sometimes can be a little bit bulky. Um, and, you know, from a plastic aesthetic surgeon point of view, it may not look as great as a nice fascia cutaneous flap, but I think from a functional view, point of view, it's great. This is a, a, a really nice um, example of a medial sural artery perforator flap. So as Matt was saying, this is a fascia cutaneous flap that we can take from the same leg as the, the wound that we're trying to, to reconstruct. So I, I think that's, it's a really nice practical flap to do because you can have a leg torn okay, um, on the same leg. Everything's in one operative field. There's no moving around. Um, you know, you can find your recipient vessels in the, around the ankle and then work on raising your flap and everything's nice and close together. And it's a very satisfying flap to do. Um, the flap itself is harvested from the calf area. Um, the blood vessel that supplies the flap is the medial sural artery um, coming off the popliteal. It does tend to have, you know, quite a, it's quite a short uh, pedicle and it runs through the gastroc muscle. So it's a little bit of a tedious dissection, but usually not too bad. And it's fairly straightforward to raise. And the beauty of it is it gives you this lovely thin pliable flap, um, you know, with a nice uh, durable skin and a good cosmetic result. The downside, however, I think is the donor site, uh, especially in women, uh, you know, showing off the back of your legs with a, with a skirt, it's not a great scar to have. So I think that's something that you have to be really careful consenting people for um, prior to this operation, because, it, you know, it's not as well hidden as say, for example, a groin flap. Um, but I think it is that much easier to raise. So it's, uh, you know, it's a decision that needs to be made, I think, with the patient. So that's it really for, um, for foot and ankle. Um, as Matt alluded to at the very beginning, I think the key take home message is probably prevention is better than cure and patient selection is vital. Try not to get into the situation ideally where you do have a wound breakdown. Um, the aim is to optimize your patients as best you can, maybe get the vascular surgeons involved to, to optimize the blood supply. Smoking uh, and flap surgery really is a no-no. Um, arteriopaths as well. Um, if, you know, if they have got problems, then I would recommend CT angios to, to get a good idea of um, the, the blood supply to the, the foot and ankle. Observe the unique demands of the foot. Try and get uh, glabrous skin onto the sole of the foot. Uh, and above all, don't panic. Uh, you can see that no matter how large the hole, we can normally cover it. Um, and yeah, as I said, if you want a useful aid memoir, then microsurgeon.org is a useful place just to get an idea of what flaps are available. Uh, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you, Matt, for a great talk uh, and fantastic uh, cases there. Um, so, I think one of the key messages that I got is if you are an orthopod or a, especially a foot and ankle surgeon, then you have to be best friends with a plastic surgeon probably just to get you out of trouble. Um, we're going to take some questions now. And then if you have time, then we go on to, I know you have a case um, discussion as well. So from my point of view, uh, as a foot and ankle uh, person, what is the most difficult area uh, for you guys to deal with in the, in the foot or the around the ankle to reconstruct? It's good with the sole really, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's yeah, so, it's, 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 high, it's so specialized. It's and around the heel area, which I find very tricky. They don't tend to heal much. Is that the same sort of what you... I guess from our point of view, apart from trauma, we're mostly doing skin stuff, you know, chopping things out, lesions, and skin cancers, but you don't really get skin cancers on glabrous skin. Mm. Really rare. So it's not often the melanoma, 
uh, and then we have to put a graft on. But yeah, when you have wounds on the sole of the foot, there can be a long, long-term problem with some quite a bit of patience. One trick I have found is that kind of, um, we haven't mentioned actually, Adam, but I forgot that, is uh, sometimes you have a, a flap and a graft and when it meets the glabrous skin, you get this kind of rim of cornified skin, which can be really quite problematic. Um, the best trick for that, which I've got from Badatri, is you actually just shave it. You just shave it back and that really, really helps. And then moisturize it, Vaseline, an ointment is best. Or um, one of the 10% urea creams, one called CCS, uh, can be very good at dealing with that kind of hardened skin. But, but they can be really quite bitter about that painful area. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, another question. So I think you briefly touched on that. How to protect the perforators when you're doing uh, uh, leg fasciotomies? Any practical way, please? Well, I think, um, Adam said, the way you plan the incision, for me, uh, if I was looking for them, you get the um, handheld 8 meg Doppler and you've got your perforators at roughly, what, uh, 5, 10, 15 centimetres. And you can feel the tip of the probe dropping into where the perforator is and you hear the signal. So that I'd be physically listening with a handheld Doppler. Adam? Yeah, I agree. I think the aim is to sort of follow those fat breast BOA guidelines. And if in doubt, just sort of call your friendly plastic surgeon to come and help you um, to bride the wound together, which is ideally how it sort of should be taking place for these uh, big open fractures. Um, if in doubt, stick to those markings uh, in, in the guidelines. Great. Uh, and same person has um, sort of another part to that. Um, and what is the commonest bad fixator sites as plastic surgeons that you guys have seen? So I presume if you play around the medial. <laughs> well, uniaxial, if it's just a, a one dimensional fixator, then it's going to be on the anti-medial part of the leg. There's not a problem. There's no blood vessels. That's why it's such a bloody awful yeah. place to operate. So you can have that. You can put your pins through there, no problem. Um, I found with the circular frames that the guys who are doing the circular frames are much more aware of where they're sticking their their bicycle spokes, should we say? Um, and putting the frame on normally, ha I haven't seen a problem. However, I have this one case I remember where, as a registrar, we put an ALT flap onto uh, a lower limb at Chelmsford and I moved to the Royal London and the patient followed me because they had to have a more complicated circular frame put on. And unfortunately, when they put the wires through, they went through the flap, hit the perforator and they killed about a third of the flap. So the moral there would be the known anatomy they'll know to avoid. Uh, if you're doing, a, if there is a free flap over something, get someone to have a little chat with first. And again, a Doppler will find you the vessel. Great, thanks. Uh, another, actually, this is quite practical. If the patient um, will not or cannot stop smoking, will that st stop you guys uh, attempting reconstruction? Yes. Okay. Um, well, patients have to take responsibility for their, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's a teenage kid who's smoking one cigarette a day, it's a bit different, but if it's something you can wait for, an elective situation, then I, I just won't operate if they're smoking because if it all breaks down, it's your problem. And they are the arterial path, they're the smoker. Uh, if, if it's a trauma operation, you have to do it. I mean, you know, you just have to consent them, warn them, you know, and they need to stop smoking straight away after you've done it, basically. They tend to listen to their legs hanging off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Going back to that, I mean, a short thing, that calcaneal guy who had the ALT flap and the hole in that kind of ring plate um, was the easiest flap and raise and plum I'd ever done. And it went off in recovery, went white. I couldn't believe it. And I went back and um, uh, redid it. Kind of white clot sitting in the anastomosis, which I've never seen. And after the turn, he was a smoker, but he was on nicotine tablets. And he had a pack this big and he was chewing this nicotine gum like bilio. Uh, I've never seen a white clot like that, and I wouldn't believe it unless I'd seen it. And um, he, we had heparinized him to get the flap to work. Okay, uh, I know it's nine, or just gone past nine. I'll take a last question. It's about, so skin closures. We know around ankle fractures, it's very swollen. If you operate within 24 hours, it's fine. Otherwise you wait and it's the, the fourth day, fifth day, it's very. Now, if you are closing the sk skin, is there any, sort of um, 
any advice about if it's tight? I mean, personally, I would leave it then. I wouldn't close it if it's really tight. But is there any advice or uh, how you would manage that at all? Or any trips, tips and tricks to actually? So it depends on the skin quality, because if it's older, bad skin edematous, if it's pitting edema, then it's going to struggle. I think the, the key thing here is, is the mattress sutures you use or what's called a summer lad suture, which we have got a picture of where you go through the loop and tie it, can be very useful. And just space your sutures out. So the fluid, remember wounds heal between stitches. I remember being told that as an SHO, it's very true. Don't over suture it. You'll have areas of necrosis all the way along. So I think your point actually, yeah, don't do a partial closure, put a dressing on, call for plastics, put a Pico on or an incisional vac. Um, any of those devices and then maybe come back after another another couple of days and take yeah I, I totally agree so if you can't close it just put a temporize it with a vac if you're going to suture it use a pulley suture take nice broad bites away from the skin especially in fragile skin so it doesn't cut through um and yeah an incisional vac is a really useful option if it's quite edematous just to help it um yeah suck it out. edema is a real problem I, I do lymphedema surgery as well and if you and a preemptive thing for those doing elective surgery, uh, if I have someone who's going to have a, a big skin cancer excision and graft, I will wrap their legs if they've got edematous venous disease. Get the girls to do pre, you know, in, in the clinic preemptive um, bandaging. Get the edema down. Your life is so much easier. Great, that's fantastic. Okay, thank you both very much for this fantastic um, lecture. Uh, uh, it was extremely useful, uh, definitely for me. I'm sure all the attendees and I had a, quite a big attendance. So thank you both. Uh, and then we have the next week, um, last in this series of the webinars. Uh, the feedback code is on the chat as well. And we'll see you guys next week on the 25th of Feb. Um, yes, one last thing. I saw one of the questions. There's a question about maggots. Uh, it's just an important point. If it's in a big wound, do a biopsy, make sure it's not a cancer, because we see that. Great. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>